program you were about to see was produced just a few months after the 1980 eruption. This official documentary conveys the sense of time and place that modern documentaries simply cannot recreate. We present this documentary without any editorial intervention except for the shortening of some sequences to keep the plot moving. Sunday morning, May 18, 1980. It was like any other morning for a Forest Service tree planting crew on the lower southern flank of the mountain until 8.32 a.m. seemed to happen in an instant. The whole top of the mountain, tons of ash, rock and ice, rocketed into the stratosphere. The cloud reached some 15 miles up into the sky. The sight was spectacular. As most of you already know, we had a major eruption occurring at 8.32 approximately this morning on Mount St. Helens. It does appear that the northwest flank of the mountain seems to be gone. We, they have indicated that there have been some mud flows that have come down the southeast flank of the mountain. Emergency procedures have been put into effect. At 10.15 this morning, the Cowlitz County reported that a 12-foot wall of water was coming down the Tula River, and this was verified by the Washington State Patrol. The raging wall of water caused by the melted ice and snow roared through a logging camp, picking up more debris as it went, knocking out bridges, cabins, and homes. In a matter of hours, the flood surged under the Tootle River Bridge on Interstate 5, forcing closure of the main arterial between Seattle and Portland. Entire forests with logs hundreds of years old passed by stunned onlookers. Eventually, the logs and mud reached the Columbia River, clogging the river channel and closing it to freighter traffic. But the wind was blowing the ash in a northeasterly direction, and at noon it was pitch black in much of central and eastern Washington. CITAM and CATS FM urges everyone to not panic. Uh, if you want to start getting out some water supply, the gritty now, cloud seemed to some uh, like the end of the world. I'm sorry, the road is closed from here any further east. Okay. This is as far east as you can go. All over eastern Washington, people and other living things suddenly had to deal with a world full of ash. Ash from a plume that eventually spread around the world. For a while, roads and highways hundreds of miles away had to be closed due to blowing ash. The ash was everywhere. And because it was so light and fine, the grit got into everything. Water simply turned it into a substance with the consistency of wet cement. Meanwhile, the biggest rescue operation in the history of the Northwest was underway, involving military helicopter units, volunteers, and Forest Service employees, all coordinated by the county sheriffs. Look at this. It doesn't even look like the same country. Uh, even the valleys have changed. Be, uh, it, nothing matches the map. Where's Spirit Lake? Is that it over there? I can't believe I've camped up in this area. It doesn't look like any place I've ever been before. Rescue operations lasted for two weeks. 170 people were brought to safety, but 57 were dead or missing. Geologist David Johnston was at a scientific research station six miles northwest of the mountain. Harry Truman was at his lodge. Neither was ever found. Okay, I think we've got a car down here on the left. Looks like a Japanese car of some type. From the perilous vantage point of a still photographer and the actual recorded transmission of a ham radio operator, 
we learned a lot about what actually happened in the first few minutes of the eruption. Photographer Gary Rosenquist barely escaped. Radio operator Jerry Martin did not. This was not an eruption that spewed molten lava. But throughout the day, pyroclastic flows of hot gases, ash, and pumice rolled down the mountain at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, searing everything in the way. In the valleys below, steaming hot mud flowed over businesses, campgrounds, roads, bridges, homes. The blast had leveled about 40,000 acres of prime timber. The avalanches of debris, rocks, mud, ice and snow, created a massive natural dam at one end of Spirit Lake. Should the dam give way, communities downstream would be threatened by catastrophic flooding. To reduce the threat, the Army Corps of Engineers first used pumps and later a tunnel to keep the lake at a safe level. On privately owned lands, salvage operations to reclaim the downed timber got underway quickly. After a careful environmental analysis, the Forest Service allowed salvage in the National Forest. Though there have been lesser eruptions several times since May 1980, Scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey visit the steaming crater continuing to monitor the changes taking place. <laughs> 